Greetings and welcome to my presentation today where we'll discuss a topic that unfortunately I don't believe gets as much attention as it should. Here's the bottom line up front. What happens to all of our beloved ham gear when that inevitable day arrives when we become a silent key? I'm sure you'll agree that we have to acknowledge that all of us will inevitably become a silent key someday and unfortunately that day may arrive unexpectedly. That said, we need to prepare ahead of time to make it as simple as possible for our families, the majority of whom are probably not hams, to dispose of our equipment in a timely manner once their grieving process is no longer overwhelming. We should also consider how to maximize the monetary return to our family from the sale of our ham related items or alternatively donating them appropriately to ham friends and organizations. Although this cartoon is funny in its own way, it may not be far off the mark for many of us. So let's get started. First, here's a bit of background info on me. I'm Dino Pappas, call sign KL0S, and I live in Williamsburg, Virginia. Perhaps like some of you, I started my ham career in a high school electronics shop where I received my novice license with the call sign WN6FZN in 1969. My dad was also a strong proponent for my entry into amateur radio as he was a former Greek merchant marine radio telegrapher and helped me learn Morse code. Our high school ham club was an integral part of that electronics shop and I still have friends from that era that I keep in contact with all these years later. I quickly upgraded my license to general and advanced class and then went off to college at the University of California at Davis, received my electrical engineering degree and was commissioned a United States Army 2nd Lieutenant of Infantry from the ROTC program at the school. My first assignment was to Fort Richardson, Alaska, where I met my better half, Toby, who is now KL0SS, and at the time was the brand new second lieutenant who moved in next door to me in the bachelor officer's quarters, and of course, the rest is history. We moved to various assignments across the United States, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Fort Monroe, Virginia, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, back to Fort Wainwright, Alaska, and back again to Forts Monroe and Bragg, where I finally retired from active duty at the end of 2001 after 26 years. And our final move here to Williamsburg uh, a few years back. And here's that love of my life, and taking the steps we'll talk about today will hopefully someday assist her when I become a silent key. Lots of hobbyists collect stuff. Some of us have multiple hobbies, many of which include valuable items as well. There are philatelists, those who collect stamps. Numismatists collect coins. Amateur astronomers may collect telescopes and their associated accessories. Model railroad buffs build layouts and many collect different gauges and even model engines. Panopictographists collect comic books, which is one of my other downfalls with a significant collection that Along with our ham radio equipment, I have to plan for how it will be handled someday as well. And of course, we ham radio operators also collect stuff, often a lot of stuff. Radios, both new and boat anchors with accessories, teletype machines and computer gear, towers and antennas, test equipment and components, QSL cards, and many other things that fill up our shacks attic spaces, and garages. So how are we going to deal with all this stuff? Noel Beardsley, K8NB's April 2018 QST article titled The Inventory List should resonate, pun intended, with many hams who, like me, are facing the fall and winter of our lives rather than the spring. Or as one man put it, there are more days behind us than there are ahead of us. Noel gave us great advice on creating an inventory list of our beloved equipment in the event that we were to unexpectedly become a silent key. I wanted to build on his advice and examine the larger issue of how we can best help our own family and the families of our ham friends when they are faced with disposing of their loved ones ham radio equipment. 
With all this in mind, I wrote an article that appeared in the September 2019 issue of QST that dealt with this larger issue of how we can best help our own family and the families of our ham friends when they are faced with disposing of their loved ones, beloved equipment, and materials. Over the years, I've been involved in assisting the families of several Silent Key estate situations, and hopefully my experience can be useful to you as well. My better half says that I like things organized, and if you look in the dictionary next to the term obsessive compulsive disorder, you'll probably see my picture. And you can tell from a few pictures of our shack that I do deserve that title, sometimes much to Toby's chagrin. So I've tried my best to organize our significant collection of ham radio stuff to make it easier for that inevitable time that one or both of us become a silent key. Let's talk about some things you can do to organize your estate, things that are useful both now and in the future, helping the people handling your ham radio estate. Organizing your equipment manuals, receipts, original packing materials, and repair records in a centralized location is a good start, and as K8NB recommends, you should have a detailed inventory that assists your helper, whoever that might be, in preparing your equipment for sale and or donation. Although the original purchase price of the equipment most likely does not reflect its current value, having that information can be useful. And as an added benefit, your inventory can be used for insurance purposes in the event of a loss before you become a silent key. Consider keeping an electronic or paper copy of your lists in your safe deposit box along with your other important records. Okay, here are some first thoughts. Now that we've agreed that we all have an expiration date, how do we best prepare to help our families before we become a silent key? First, we have to realize that even though our equipment is often an integral and cherished part of us, disposing of it may neither be easy nor offer a large monetary return for our families. But first, just to cover some of the obvious non-ham related things you should consider, having a current will, a trust if appropriate, powers of attorney, and an advanced medical directive in place. How about putting together a front door medical information binder? What's that? I can't take credit for this as I read about it many years ago. This simply involves putting together an information binder and leaving it near your front door. In our binder, for example, we have copies of our military and Medicare identification cards, a list of our emergency points of contact, our current drug prescriptions, since whenever you go to the ER, for example, they always ask you for what medications you're taking, a copy of our medical powers of attorney, and more. The intent is that if you have to call 911 and get carted off to the hospital, you can have a single collated reference containing all the things you might need at the hospital in one place a place where you or your family members can remember to grab it as you're going out the door. And lastly, have you identified someone, a trusted person, that can help your family with your ham radio estate? We'll come back to that thought in a moment. Of course, everyone's situation is different, but the concept of having a plan applies to all of us. You should decide ahead of time how you want your ham estate disposed of. I believe that hams who have prearranged the disposal of their equipment stand the best chance of making sure their wishes are fulfilled and that their family recoups a reasonable amount from the sale of their items. You might choose a friend that you know would be willing to assist your family once you become a silent key. Many families may not even know who our ham friends are, so choose someone you think would be willing and able to act as your ham estate representative. A member of our local club did exactly that not too long before he unfortunately passed away. That conversation paved the way for the disposition of his equipment that included designating several pieces of equipment to go to individuals with the proceeds from the sale of the remaining items provided to his widow. Once your trusted representative has agreed, you can host a joint meeting with them and your family's decision makers. Doing so identifies to each party how the ham part of your estate will be handled once you're gone. Having this discussion together ensures that your family knows that someone will be fulfilling your desires and looking after their best interests with their ham estate. 
Documenting this plan makes sure that everyone involved understands what will happen in the hopefully distant future. Your club may offer a formal or at least an informal service to help dispose of a deceased ham's possessions. If not, talk to your club's leadership about organizing such a program. If you want to donate some or all of your equipment directly to other ham family members and friends, your club or perhaps multiple clubs, then designate that ahead of time. Create a file or binder that includes your important ham radio related documents in an accessible place that your family and ham estate representative both know about. And finally, as an aside, and it may sound a bit strange, consider drafting your own obituary and, if you desire, include information about the ham part of your life. Think about it. Who knows more about you than you? And one benefit of being active in your local amateur radio club is that the membership can be a ready source of hams who may be willing to assist your family when it's time for them to deal with the ham part of your estate. Taking time in advance to divest yourself of some parts of your ham estate that are no longer needed is one way to minimize your survivor's efforts later. So what do I mean by the calculus of time? Simply put, you look into the future and imagine how the rest of your days may play out and how over time you'll divest yourself of your beloved equipment. Does it make sense to downsize now or later? As I just discussed, selling your excess equipment is one course of action. Yes, I know, having two extra HF radios gives you tremendous backup, but realistically, do you need them now? Here's a disclaimer though, pay no attention to the pictures I showed you earlier of our shack since I believe in redundancy. You may want to donate some or all of your equipment to your club and allow them to sell the items with the proceeds going to the club. Try to keep your ham related reference materials with hams in your area. You can also check with your local library for their donation policy. You're probably aware of the different ways to sell your equipment at auction sites, ham fests, and via for sale lists. My message to you is to think about it ahead of time and take whatever appropriate action you feel is right for you. In addition, the AWRL laboratory accepts donations of clean amateur radio equipment and electronic test gear from a non-smoking environment to help support its various programs. Bob Allison, WB1GCM, who was up until just recently the lab's product review engineer, explained to me that the League is a tax-exempt, non-profit organization as described in Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code and holds a federal tax identification for which contributions are tax-deductible to the extent permitted by law. Bob went on to explain that each week the lab accepts donations and that a team of volunteers unpack, inventory, clean, and test donated items. Another volunteer prepares an acknowledgement letter to the donor on AWRL letterhead. As a not-for-profit organization, the League is not allowed to place a value on your donation. That is a matter for you or your representative. Recent changes to our U.S. federal tax codes may impact the resolution of your estate, so check with your tax professional for advice. Once again, everyone's situation is different. Families without assistance may turn to a one-time estate purchaser who removes the burden of a lengthy disposal process. This may not maximize the financial return, but there may be great value in this process being a one and done. Toby and I have a friend who recently became a silent key who knew his ham estate would be difficult to dispose of, especially, for example, his 85-foot Roan 45 tower. He downsized using one of the several estate buyers shown here to take the majority of his gear, leaving him with a HF transceiver, amplifier, and simple wire antennas. In the end, his foresight really paid off for his family. Anyone who has been involved in settling a loved one's estate knows that there are a no multitude of notifications that must be made. Shown here are some examples of some HAM-specific notifications. Let your family know how to report your passing to the AWRL for posting in the silent key column in QST. Tell your family how to cancel your amateur radio license with the FCC. If a HAM family member wishes to be assigned your call sign, let them know how they can initiate their request. Many of us have accounts with Logbook of the World, QRZ.com, QSL bureaus, probably many different email reflectors and other relationships. 
Some family members will announce their loved one's passing via these reflectors. QRZ.com pages, for example, can be edited to indicate the ham has become a silent key, but to do so, the folks handling your ham estate need to know how to gain access to these accounts. Let's shift gears and talk about assisting other ham families in their time of need. If you're willing and able to assist a deceased amateur's family dispose of the ham portion of their estate, here are some things you should consider when dealing with them. Families take different amounts of time to work through their grief. Simply letting them know you're willing to help is a good place to start, and they'll seek you out when the time is right. Knowing this may even help them a bit with their grieving process. Once they're ready, and if you haven't already had a detailed discussion with them, ask how you can help. Gain the family's trust and confidence to make sure they know that you are looking out for their best interest. Ask yourself, what if it were my family? How would I want my ham estate representative to treat them? Ensure they understand that your efforts will be directed only toward the ham radio part of the estate. This is important as you don't want to inadvertently put yourself into a position dealing with other aspects of the estate process. Determine the extent of the ham-related items as it may or may not be significant. Hopefully the silent key has already done that for you with a good inventory and disposition instructions. The family may have no clue as to the value of the items and may undervalue or, on the other hand, have unrealistic expectations. Determine what does and does not have salvageable value. Rolls of old used coax and connectors, equipment carcasses, outdated component collections, especially very old electrolytic capacitors, and routine hobby-related paperwork and files, etc., may be recycled or disposed of appropriately. Many locations have periodic electronics recycling programs. Once you have an idea of the scope of this effort, then decide together how to proceed. You should know that helping the Hams family will not necessarily be easy, but that it is a worthwhile and satisfying thing to do. Make sure the family knows that it may take a significant amount of time to dispose of all the equipment. Agree with them where it will be stored as this process continues. You can prepare equipment for sale lists for your local clubs to distribute to members using their email reflectors. Towers and antennas can be problematic and may require the services of a professional to remove. Some hams, myself included, have had success with offering to give a tower and antenna system away to someone willing to take it down and remove it. Make sure that the family keeps potential personal injury insurance liabilities in mind if they consider offering the items under these conditions. Consider, if you're able, offering a reasonable price for the estate equipment and then keep or dispose of the items at your own pace. I have personally done that in order for my friend's family to receive a timely, mutually agreeable payment. It then took me well over a year to sell the equipment and recoup my cost. A positive aspect was that I was able to retain a few items that will always remind me of my good friend. You may want to offer to sell equipment on consignment at local ham fests, assuring the family that you will try to bring them the highest return, selling the items as if they were your own. You can ask technically oriented members of your club to test electronic items and document their status. Remember that some hams may be interested in non-working equipment they feel that they can repair themselves. As such, sale prices for non-working items should be set accordingly. Your representative or club can consider hosting an auction to dispose of your ham equipment and materials. If something is valuable, make sure you identify it as such. You can announce the availability of unique equipment on HF and VHF for sale nets and enthusiast-specific email reflectors. There are groups who collect Drake, Collins, military equipment, test equipment, and others that I know would appreciate you doing so. Be a motivated seller, but remember to try to maximize the return for the family. Keep a good record of the items sold, the price they sold for, and in general what items were recycled or disposed of. And provide sales proceeds to the family at a reasonable time interval instead of waiting until the liquidation process is complete. Finally, think about gathering a few small mementos such as the Silent Keys call sign badge, ham-related pictures, videos, hobby articles they may have written, 
newspaper articles and others that include the silent key in them and organize the materials into a file or binder that will help the family remember how important the amateur radio hobby was to their ham. I keep a binder that includes the obituary along with a copy of the QST silent key page that my own departed friends call signs appear on. Doing so helps me remember them fondly. So, are you prepared in the event that you suddenly and unexpectedly become a silent key tomorrow? Would your loved ones know how to dispose of your ham estate items in the most appropriate manner? The bottom line is that you should plan ahead now for inevitably becoming a silent key because you owe it to yourself and to your family. Well, that's about it. And hopefully some of our discussion today will be useful to you and your family and also prepare you to assist other ham families in their time of need as well. Please feel free to contact me after today with questions and suggestions you may have to make this presentation more useful in the future. Thanks. Okay, now I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Okay, uh, by raising some hands or by uh, putting a text in the text uh, uh, chat form, let's have some questions. I, I got to head out. I just wanted to say thank you very much for this uh, session. It was very informative, and uh, I'll definitely be using these uh, tools in my life. You sound really young, so uh, it may be a while before this uh, applies to you, but something to keep in the back of your mind and uh, share with your friends, too. So you just that, that is my, micro my, my microphone. <laughs> I think we all need your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Anybody uh, else want to make a comment about silent key sales they've been involved with and problems that they've had or techniques they've used to? Um... Okay. I, I, I can't, with me up uh, as the only picture on here, I really can't see everybody. So you may want to take me down and let me uh, just see whatever the people are in the uh, Hollywood Squares thing. Yeah, there we go. A comment from N6VI. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, this is Marty. Um, I've I've done the I've done the uh, assistance to families uh, over the years uh, for several friends who passed uh, from 25 years ago to just last year. And uh, a, it's a lot of work. So uh, even if you're looking to get a club to put some sort of group together, it's still a lot of work. And 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 it's as much as it, as putting together a field day or any anything else. So. Um, but if you can zero in on the high value stuff, you're really going to have to kind of triage the things. Zero in on the high value stuff. Try to find the manuals if you can. Uh, test or have somebody test it out to make sure you know the working condition, because that's going to improve the marketability of the thing if you can assert, you know, assert that it, it has been tested out. And if there are any flaws, you know what they are and you can identify them. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, fortunately, you know, from 25 years ago, I didn't have the we didn't have the internet and and all the resources for looking at market prices for used equipment that we do now. But uh, going through looking at recent sale prices and so on, you can get an idea of what makes sense. And usually, you're going to price it a little low if you happen to know the history of the equipment. Um, um, in in one case. Uh, the the ham who passed was a longtime de expedition buddy of mine, and I knew where that radio had been and where how it was used and so on. And I was able to use that actually uh, to help market it, and we got a good good price for the widow. Um, but you know, as I say, you kind of have to triage. You get the uh, the highest value things, identify them, start working on on disposal there, and then it, you're there's going to be a lot of small stuff that you're just not gonna have the time uh, to deal with. And that's where you may wanna look at either, you know, donating uh, to a club and let them sort through it for people who may want a, you know, a multimeter or something else or a small power supply or, uh, or one of the uh, estate uh, entities that you uh, pointed out. Yeah, they, they, they will, uh, I don't know, I don't know this for a fact, but for the most part, what I've heard is it's, it's not a lot of money on the dollar, um, you know, it, but having said that, like, like I said during the presentation, there, there is value sometimes of it just being over with 
and it all being gone instead of, because a lot of families, they go, oh, what in the world do I do now? Because their ham didn't take the time or the, to, to plan, at least do some rudimentary planning ahead of time. Uh, so that it, you know, I mean, of course, you're going to be gone. What do you care? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think we all care. So uh, as a matter of fact, I just had a discussion with a cousin of mine who's about six or seven years older than I today that I didn't know he was even in the hospital. And uh, he's got some serious issues. Uh, yeah. And, and the other the other thing, you know, kind of take your time in terms of putting things into, you know, uh, uh qrz.com and 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 other you know online sort resources because that's when you're going to get you know slick willy to come by and say hey i'll give you 500 bucks for the whole thing and takes you know ten thousand dollars worth of equipment so uh best not to uh do the broadcasting of the passing uh to the general populace um until you've had a chance to sort things through michelle i think i saw your hand right or is that from before? No, yeah, it's nope, my, yeah. my hands, right? Yeah. So I, I wanted to um, thank you very much for, for giving this presentation to us. Deeply appreciated. And um, we had a, an experience with a, a silent key who was an avid programmer. Uh, he passed away uh, just recently. And some of the, the source code, uh, the code that you write that gets compiled or, or scripted into the, the, the final product, um, so figuring out what to do with that and trying to to license that code and release that code or to to make sure that it was uh, saved turned out to be a lot harder than and a longer process than than anyone expected. So it's not always uh, gear uh, like physical things with molecules, but a, but a growing number of um, of of computer programs and uh, uh, written work. Um, computing. So that was something that we kind of learned the hard way uh, you know, recently. And uh, and then a, a, I'll go ahead and, and repeat a question that I that I think I asked you uh, back at Ham Expo, and that's um, with new modern SDRs, they all tend to look the same. It's uh, a little easy to figure out like what uh, classic radio looks like because they're so distinctive and gorgeous. Uh, and generally larger, um, but software-defined radios tend to all look like little black boxes, and they're very anonymous. And one might be worth six thousand dollars, and one might be worth sixty. So those are the sorts of things that you might want to uh, take some time to to inventory, <laughs> because the the difference can be pr pretty large uh, in yeah. the value of something that that does not look uh, at all like it might be that valuable. Uh, so that's uh, back to you. Yeah, that gosh, that's a really interesting point about the code. I had never thought about that, and I'm going to think about that some and, and add that into uh, this presentation if I ever make it in the future. Because beats the heck out of me what what I would do about it. So I may <laughs> I may have to correspond with you and get some ideas. But Anthony, you had uh, your hand raised. You're muted. Funny because it was very similar to what Michelle just brought up. I was going to mention the fact that. Uh, as a, a club trustee, I'm in, I'm responsible for the website, all the accounts, uh, rosters, things of that nature. So uh, that's another thing we need to plan. I, you had a lot of great ideas that I'm going to implement, but there's a lot of things that are not really um, hardware. Uh, I noticed, you know, recently we just lost one of the big news services. The Southgate News Service went away because the person that was running it passed away and you know I'm responsible for multiple websites and multiple resources and again sharing of those with someone is something we need to make sure we're doing in that process too yeah we uh one of our uh, our club trustee our call sign crust trustee passed away a couple of years ago he was the guy who had the conversation with uh, his friend here who who then knew what how to dispose of the equipment but what we and i think i was the club president at the time he he had all that stuff you know he was the club trustee for the call sign and he had the 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 credentials for our web page and all of that and and i said hey guys we need to distribute this out you, you need to have a in case of fire break glass 
you know, even if it's an envelope sealed and put away somewhere with the uh, the passwords to your club's website or, or whatever, uh, you, you don't don't necessarily want to hand them around, but they've got to be accessible so that somebody can, you know, do something if you suddenly become a silent key. Somebody's got to take care of the website if, you know, so anyway, that's a great point, Anthony. Boy, that yeah, sure is. I, I, I've had that problem with a, a nonprofit that wasn't related to amateur radio, took over as treasurer, and everything was on the uh, computer of the uh, pro, uh, the deceased president that we couldn't access. Uh, oh. Another of my uh, ham friends who's gone through some uh, you know, traumatic stuff, like all having his house burned down in a big fire, um, he, uh, he put a binder together and it, 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 the binder is labeled, oh, no, Steve's dead. And then it describes everything that they need to do. Uh, so that that was actually a pretty thoughtful thing for him to do. Yeah, my, my binder yeah. says silent key estate, but I'm going to change the title to it. Like, look here first or, or something like that. I do have a I do have a just in case envelope all filled out. And it's a note to my wife and all that kind of stuff. But. Yeah, that's a great Dave has, Dave has a question, and I think it's about LastPass that he made in the chat. That's very interesting, and I think you could add it to your presentation. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to point out <clears throat> that I'm a uh, I, I'm a, a user of LastPass Families account, um, which is the, the LastPass Vault program. And when you set up a LastPass Families account, and I think it's like um, four dollars a month, so it's just like a really you know, uh, almost uh, pittance, really, for what it does for you. Not only can you use it to keep track of all your passwords on your websites and stuff, and most people don't realize they probably already have logins to like a couple of hundred different websites. <laughs> so, and you really don't want to use the same password on all those sites. Okay. So having having something like a password a program like that helps. But a password, the LastPass families lets you do something which I found very useful you can designate someone else in the family to be your backup in case something happens to you. They can ask for access to your account and it's a dead man switch. If you don't deny it within say two days or four days, then they get access to all your passwords. Oh, wow. That's, boy, I, I, I need to, uh, to look into that one. Now, another thing I do personally, not necessarily ham related, but is I have two hard drives, two portable hard drives. And once a month I go to the, go to the safe deposit box and swap the hard drives and then I keep the other one on hand. And as I go through the month, besides going to other backup kinds of places, I, I go to that hard drive and the, the people at the credit union know me when I come in there because it takes me, uh, will you need a booth? No, I'll just be here for a 10 second drive by because all I do is just swap the two hard drives. And uh, that's, that's <laughs> another thing you can do too. Of course, then legacy computer interfaces and that type thing, you know, come into play. The two hard drives used to have uh, uh, SCSI ports on them. So <laughs> don't have those anymore. They're now USB. So, so one well, of these days, they'll be USB-C, I suppose. So. I, I can say that I'm also a very happy user of Backblaze, which is uh, which is a, a, a backup uh, system. Uh, it's an off-site backup uh, storage system. And it just backs up your computer for you in the background continuously. And, and then if something happens, if the hard drive crashes or you lose a, a, a drive or you accidentally, even if you delete files, you can then restore them, you know, from off from off the Backblaze site. I had a drive, an, an external uh, four terabyte drive that was full of over 100,000 photos that crashed. Mm -hmm. And I had it all backed up on Backblaze. And so I was able to just ask them to send me a replacement drive, you know, with all the photos on it. Oh. And, and, and what they do is they uh, uh, is they charge you for the drive when they send it to you. But if you send it back to them in 30 days, they refund you the price of the drive. So and they'll ship it to you for free. So the only thing you have to pay is for sending it back. Is that kind of like iCloud, Michelle, for, for us Macintosh types, I suppose? Yeah, very similar. The, yeah, our time, uh, our time little, machine. Yeah. Time Machine is a much better, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's what it's yeah. like. That, that's for Apple people only, though. That's yeah, cool. it is. Those are those are really super good points. And yeah, Don so from Idaho, he doesn't have any audio. He says, if you were a club handling silent key donations, be certain that you have a very clearly defined process and clarify exactly who is going to be doing it, which yeah. is a good comment. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. There, there's a couple of us in our club anyway who are more technically oriented, I suppose. Uh, and so usually the silent key, because I have a three car garage, usually my garage becomes the storage place for all of that stuff as we, uh, as we go through it, but it, it makes it nice. Cause I can just bring stuff up here to the bench and just, and I've repaired a lot of stuff, but over the last, uh, four years or so, I think we've added, oh gosh, probably at least $6,000, something like that to our treasury that we never had before, just because we've had, you know, more and more silent key type things and, and, and donations, you know, sometimes a family member will just say, Hey, look, you just take it and, and just uh, keep the money in the club, which is, which is nice. So. Okay. Dave new, you had your hand up earlier. You got a comment in the, in the chat session. You want to take the floor for a moment? I, I, I just I just wrote it down in there for people's, uh, um, you know, to to because I was talking about last pass families account and mm -hmm. then Backblaze backup. And and the nice thing about Backblaze is that it's only fifty dollar a year subscription uh, for a computer. And it includes all the local drives that are attached to the computer. It's unlimited space. OK, so, cool. yeah, I, really nice, good deals. I mean, the family account, the last pass families is four dollars a month. Um, you know, it's for me. It's the two best pieces of insurance that I've got going for me. <laughs> but the question, the question is, who knows about that? Oh uh, well, I mean, my my family, my wife okay. is yeah yeah she's she's the backup for me, right? You know, so yeah, that, and that that I think that's the important point is we, we can do all all sorts of great planning on our own and have it all planned, but if, if somebody else doesn't know about it, well. Uh, kind of alleviates the the, pro, well, the all of the planning you did if somebody can't actually do something with it but uh, yeah that's yeah. the nice thing about like LastPass and 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 one password and I'm sure all the other services now offer a uh, family plan for for password managers which before it was like an individual thing individual subscription but the the big recent trend that's super useful is that you can have a, a group usually a family but anybody you pick um, usually up to some reasonable number like four or six and mm -hmm. then all of those people are in on it so you you have a you know a backup uh multiple multiple backups it's it's really pretty nice that we started started using it here and it's already come in handy for sure okay great does anybody else have any other questions or comments I'm yes. here as long as you want me here. Yes. Uh, one of the things I was going to mention is um, it's it's much easier not to have to worry about this now if you're using log using Logbook of the World. But if you have uh, logs for D expeditions or other things that you've done that people are going to want cards from, you know, it's it's really a good idea to have them on Logbook of the World so you don't need to worry about it. But passing those on to someone else. I remember the first time I worked. Uh, um, into South America on six meters, I got a card back about a year later, and it had a note in there saying the person had passed away, but the wife filled out the card from his log and sent it back to me. So I was very pleased because I have never worked that country on six meters again. But, uh, you know, so with Logbook of the World, it wouldn't be a problem because, you know, I if you update fairly regularly up to Logbook of the World, it, you know, you can always get a QSO that way. But in the olden days, or if you have paper logs lying around, you know, you might want to think about either getting those in electronic form or getting those to someone else also. That's a good point about your logging program as well. Yeah, you really, you really, and I'll be honest with you, I have not done this myself. You, you really need to take all of these little dis, disparate things and sort of put them together into that. And I've been meaning to do it for a long time. Dear Toby, here are the things to do. <laughs> after the fact so anyway well yeah that's the power of a of a really good checklist um which i think is is the point of of uh, of your work uh for in in this particular area is to kind of develop a checklist and to get get folks uh, oriented towards it yeah now i don't know how many people have a, a vast collection of keys <laughs> but but i know many many years ago someone wrote to dear abby and said Please tell your tell your husbands not to ever do this to their widows, because 
after her husband passed away, she found a drawer full of a couple of hundred of keys and she had no idea what they went to. Or maybe what they were. <laughs> <laughs> so, I bet Dennis couldn't tell what all his keys go to. <laughs> hey, now, wait a minute. Well, I was thinking of telegraph keys. Yeah. yeah that's what I thought that's what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about, you know, turn the keys. Oh, you mean door keys? I thought yeah. you meant Morse code keys. Yes. No, no. Okay. This like, is the only group that would confuse that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need no stinky uh, keys here. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a box full of uh, all sorts of keys uh, and locks, yeah. and, and I've got them zip tied. If I ever need a padlock, I actually know where the key is at for that for that padlock. So. Yeah, that's that OCD coming through again. Michelle knows that all about me. So. Yeah, so there's a box of combination locks that they don't know the combinations to anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's on a yellow sticky Scotch tape to the back of mine. So. <laughs> and another question is um, about towers uh, and ex and outdoor equipment. That's that's something that that uh, my local club gets asked uh, about a lot. Like, yeah. hi, could you possibly help us figure out how to take down this tower? You know, and so that that needs to be on the list too. Um, yeah, like, yeah. I, like I mentioned in the, in the, in the pitch, um, offering to have somebody come and take it down, it, it's, it's, it's dicey. Yeah. But if you do some risk management, um, you can minimize the risk it's not all going to go away but usually somebody's going to come do that our uh, our club here boy you put out a note on the reflector it's like hey i need help this weekend putting up whatever and it's like we work for coffee and donuts it's uh, it's amazing how many people will show up but but that's a great point because think of all of you know think of all of the aluminum and the wires in the backyard and if better half knows nothing about all of that right it, it stays there. Um, so what do you do about that? We, we, we have folks that are probably, we have a couple of guys who are just more than willing to go climb anything. They're crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but not it's me. even worse if you're single. There is some risk, obviously, uh, especially if, if there's a, a possibility of, you know, damage to the roof or, or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> I've had situations where I looked at it and I didn't want to tackle it. I, I climbed, but the, I didn't want to tackle something like that. So I contacted somebody who does installations periodically. And I talked to the widow and I said, I suggest we let him take it down. And in exchange, let him take this amplifier, you know, kind of his payment. And that worked out uh, for everybody. But, um, you know, you, you don't want to, you certainly don't want to be messing with anything that has a, you know, needs a crane or where that when they put it up, there were no trees and now there are trees and you've got to work everything around them. Yeah. There, there are professional, I mean, you can hire a professional to take that stuff down. Now it may cost you a few bucks, but if that's the way it's got to be done safely and to protect the family, to protect the property and all of that, then you're just going to have to do that, which, which really means means that you need to put that thought process in the front end of that installation we're getting ready to put up a uh, probably a 70 foot tower here so uh i kind of need to think about well what the heck you know how but i'm having it put in by a professional tower and a ham radio professional tower installer who you know he'll be the guy if he's still around he'll be the guy that i call or my wife calls um, to come take the thing down. So uh, at least I have I have the thought process for how that might be handled in the future. So yeah, we ran wait, into wait, some, we ran uh, into I'm a sorry. similar problem with uh, uh, we'd help we were helping out a silent key taking care of things, and when it came time to remove the tower, it was not feasible to safely remove the tower without possibly damaging the house. You know, we had a hard time explaining to the person we were able to take the antennas off of it, but we weren't able to take the full structure down because it was just. There was no way to really do it uh, safely without a crane, as you said. So it was going to involve some money to take it down. Um, you know, I even here, I just I had a neighbor put up a fence now that I that means I cannot lower my my tower down the way I put it up because Ouch. when I put it up, I had a, you know there were some 
different there were trees in different places and fences in different places but it's been up for 25 20 plus years now and things have been put up around it that i had no control over yeah looking yeah. back at it i would have not put it that way but you know that at the time it was a different situation hindsight is 2020 so we we had we had another local fellow here who went silent key and he had several towers on his property uh that were uh, over 100 100 feet some uh, i think even one that was close to 200 wow. and they could not take the towers down safely so they ended up hiring a crew that came out there and they dropped the towers with all the antennas and everything on it that's the only way they could get them down yeah so <laughs> it, yeah sometimes that's just how it happens <laughs> okay i'm looking at the clock and i'm looking at the questions are there any more questions out there Yes. I think B Barry mentioned that he said he was trying to, he, he says, I am trying to formalize this process at the ARL section and club levels. Oh. And that's interesting. That would be yeah. something that would be really nice to have as a service from a, from a large uh, organization. Yeah. Um, did you want to talk about that at all? Well, no, I've just proposed it. It was down here, of course, uh, hams come down here to as their last residence. <laughs> and I get, I probably average four silent keys a week, easily, to wow. report to ARRL. So uh, it's a problem. Some of the clubs refuse to deal with it. And I think having a formal appointment of someone that knows how to deal with the states for silent keys for hands is something that we should all be trying to do. And especially at the clubs, the cl each club should have someone that will be will be able to work with their members and their widows to handle silent key estates and there should be a formal process to do that and i think that that's what i'm working on right now but i'm running into a lot of resistance against that we i don't know if anyone here knew pete rummel he was a big dxer he was a card checker he was an earth moon earther he had I think, six or eight towers in his backyard and he must have had four or five million dollars worth of ham radio equipment they're still going through his house and cataloging everything and trying to figure out how to deal with his estate because the club that, that he belonged to didn't have a formal process. If they had a formal process, it would have been done a year ago. Hmm. That's what I'm working on. Yeah, and a lot of people don't have that kind of patience because oftentimes the house is being sold. Yes. And, yeah. and the people that are buying the house, they don't want that crap there. They don't want the stuff in the backyard. They don't want the stuff in the house. They want it all gone. That, That's right. That happened here, and a lot of stuff, unfortunately, because we didn't know about it, ended up in the big blue dumpster that they brought out to the house. And yeah, like, yeah. Oh, gosh. So, well, it's been hey, it's been a real treat being with y'all tonight. I've I've got notes here for uh, things that I want to bring up with our club and things that I will add to this presentation if I ever get asked to do it again. Sort of like the Grim Reaper, I guess. So Good. Much again, I, I really appreciate you inviting me, and uh, hopefully we've generated some conversation that will bring some uh, thoughts to you, and uh, I wish you all a happy 2023 from the Grim Reaper. And that's